Good afternoon and welcome to the 184th of the COVID Calls. This is a daily discussion of the COVID-19 pandemic with a diverse collection of disaster experts. My name is Scott Gabriel Knowles. I'm a historian of disasters at Drexel University in Philadelphia. Today, we have a discussion of science journalism in the pandemic with Laura Helmuth, editor-in-chief of Scientific American Magazine. Just a reminder, you can catch COVID Calls live every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern time on YouTube. Just go to the COVID Calls YouTube channel to watch. You can also watch COVID Calls on Facebook Live and on Periscope. You can hear COVID Calls anytime recorded as podcasts on Spotify, iTunes, Podbean, or anywhere you get podcasts. You can also keep up with COVID Calls via Twitter using the handle at US of Disaster or at COVID Calls. Please do help spread the word and send suggestions for future guests and future topics, and please feel free to suggest yourself as a future guest. As of today, December 9th, 2020, there are 1,564,496 deaths from COVID-19 globally, according to the Johns Hopkins University Coronavirus Resource Center. There are 15,285,000 1,261 cases reported in the United States. There are now a total of 287,671 deaths from COVID-19 reported in the United States, and that's up from 284,887 reported yesterday. As a way to bring some humanity to the numbers, I've been reading a life story or a story of advocacy for those impacted by the pandemic in some way. I'd like to continue that now the headline of this story is debunking the false claim that COVID death counts are inflated. This was written by Christy Ashwanden, and this appeared in Scientific American October 20th, 2020. A persistent falsehood has been circulating on social media. The number of COVID deaths is much lower than official statistics, and therefore the danger of the disease has been overblown. In August, President Donald Trump retweeted a post claiming that only 6% of these reported deaths were actually from COVID-19. The tweet originated from a follower of the debunked conspiracy fantasy QAnon. Twitter removed the post for containing false information, but fabrications such as these continue to spread. Now some facts. Researchers know beyond a doubt that the number of COVID-19 deaths in the United States surpassed a quarter of a million people by November 2020. This number is supported by three lines of evidence, including death certificates. The inaccurate idea that only 6% of the deaths were really caused by the coronavirus is, quote, a gross misinterpretation, unquote, of how death certificates work, said Robert Anderson, chief mortality statistician at the CDC's National Center for Health Statistics. The first source of death data is called case surveillance. Healthcare providers are required to report cases and deaths from certain diseases, including measles, mumps, and now COVID-19, to state health departments, which pass this information along to the CDC, Anderson says. States gather all the information they can on these diseases, but this is the first pass. No one has time to double-check the information or look for missing laboratory tests, she says. The second line of evidence comes from the National Vital Statistics System which records birth and death certificates. When somebody dies, a death certificate is filed in the state where the death occurred. After the records are registered at a state level, they are sent to the National Center for Health Statistics, which tracks deaths at a national level. By the time a record gets to the vital record system, it is as close to perfect as it's going to get, Webster says. A physician, medical examiner, or cor coroner fills out the cause of mortality on the death certificate. That specialist is instructed to include only conditions that caused or contributed to death. One field lists the sequence of events leading to the death. What we're really trying to get at is the condition or disease that started the chain of events leading to the death, Anderson says. For COVID-19, that might be something like acute respiratory distress due to pneumonia due to COVID-19. A second part of the certificate lists other conditions that may have contributed to the death yet were not part of the sequence of events that led up to it. These are called comorbidities, and although they can be contributing factors, they cannot be directly involved in the chain of cause and effect that ended in death. When we ask if COVID killed somebody, 
it means did they die sooner than they would have if they didn't have the virus. Even a person with a potentially life-shortening condition such as heart disease may have lived another 5, 10, or more years had they not become infected with COVID-19. The 6% number touted by Trump and QAnon comes from a weekly CDC report stating that in 6% of the coronavirus mortality cases it counted, COVID-19 was the only condition listed on the death certificate. That observation most likely means that those death certificates were incomplete because the certifiers gave only the underlying cause of death and not the full causal sequence that led to it, Anderson says. The idea that a death certificate with ailments listed in addition to COVID-19 means that the person did not really die from the virus is simply false. The surveillance and vital statistics data provide a pretty good picture of how many deaths are attributable to the coronavirus, but they do not capture all of them. And that is where the final line of evidence comes in, excess deaths. They are the number of deaths that occur above and beyond the historical pattern for that time period, says Stephen Wolf, a physician and population health researcher at the Virginia Commonwealth University School of Medicine. In a paper published in October of this year in the Journal of the American Medical Association, Wolf and his colleagues examined death records in the United States from March 1st through August 1st and compared them with the expected mortality numbers. They found that there was a 20% increase in deaths during this time period for a total of 225,530 excess deaths compared with previous years. Two-thirds of these cases were attributed to COVID-19 on the death certificates, and Wolf says there are two types of explanations for the rest. Some of them were COVID-19 deaths that simply were not documented as such, perhaps because the person died at home and was never tested, or because the certificate was miscoded. Some of the extra deaths were probably a consequence of the pandemic, yet not necessarily of the virus itself. For instance, he says, imagine a patient with chest pain who's scared to go to the hospital because he or she does not want to get the virus and then dies of a heart attack. Wolf calls this indirect mortality. All serious analyses of these data are showing that the number of deaths we're hearing on the news is an undercount, he says. The article was debunking the false claim that COVID death counts are inflated and appeared in Scientific American October 20th, and I'll put the full link up on Twitter. Okay, I'd like to turn to our conversation for today. I've really been looking forward to this conversation. Let me introduce Laura Helmuth. Laura is the editor-in-chief of Scientific American. She's previously been an editor for the Washington Post, National Geographic, Slate, Smithsonian, and Science's News section. She serves on the boards of High Country News, Spectrum, and Sciline, and is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine's Standing Committee on the Science of Science Communication. She's a past president of the National Association of Science Writers. Laura Helmut, thank you so much for making time to come on COVID Calls today. Uh, thanks so much for having me. This is such an important conversation. Well, I'd like to start the way I usually do, which is just to find out where you're calling from and how the pandemic is looking there today. Yeah, I'm uh, outside of Washington, D.C. in Rockville, Maryland. And, you know, it's it's terrible. It's it's surging everywhere, certainly out here, too. Um, my county, Montgomery County, was one of the, you know, one of the hard hit places, not as bad as New York or um, Seattle, but also had some early cases. So we've been taking it seriously for a long time, but it's it's still coming back. Are you in in some form of lockdown situation there right now, or, or are you still able to be out and about? Yeah, we can. Uh, there are limitations on um, you know how full buildings can be, and uh, but in, in you know schools are not in session or you know, not in person session. So I wanted to ask you before we're going to talk a lot about the magazine. We're going to talk about you know your take on this extraordinary year in in science. I want to get a little background, um, and I always, uh, you know, with historians of science, you know, it's always interesting to ask them if they started out as, as a historian or as a scientist, and I think maybe the same is true with science journalists. I wonder, are you a scientist turned journalist or vice versa or, or neither, or some uh, combination of those? Tell us a little bit about your background. 
Yeah, I'm a scientist turned journalist. Um, yeah, so in, in the middle of, of graduate school, right before I was working on my dissertation, I took a little break on a, for a summer and uh, wrote for a travel guide um, to Eastern Europe for the summer and decided, oh, writing is fun too. Uh, even more fun than science, which is a you know, delightful way to make a living if you can do it. Uh, so I went to a program at UC Santa Cruz that trains people with science background to be journalists. And, uh, and from there, I went to D.C. for just a, a short mission in here for 22 years now, bouncing around from job to job in the science writing world. So what do you miss about, about science? I mean, you, you're able to cover all aspects of it from your vantage point, but, but you don't have a lab. Or maybe you do have a lab, and I'm not aware of it, but um, <laughs> what do you miss about that life? Oh yeah, so, I mean, science is a, a I mean, the, there are a lot of great things about being in science, um, but being in, in academia in general, I mean, going to, to talks, you know, the, the life of the mind, just being surrounded by people who are really excited about new ideas and, and discovering new things all the time. So like the lifestyle is great, but it's actually, you know, it, they're pretty compatible um, professions. I mean, I think both in, in journalism, especially, you know, science and health journalism and in academia, academic science, you know, you have people who are motivated by wanting to know how the world works and using evidence to get there. And, you know, people are really smart, work really, really hard. Don't get, you know, the pay is okay, but it's not great compared to, you know, what it would be in, in other industries. And uh, yeah, you're just, you're surrounded by really intriguing people who, uh, have interesting, you know, are doing interesting things and ask interesting questions. Uh, I, I, you know, you didn't escape deadlines. You didn't escape working in teams. Um, and, and I guess you, you know, again, from the science writer's vantage point, you, you get this tremendous horizontal view, right? I mean, if you get interested in some aspect of science that wouldn't be your expertise area, you not only have the license, but I suppose the responsibility as an editor to go ask questions, right? Exactly. Yeah, as a, as a reporters, you know, their whole job is to go ask pesky questions and, and find out things. Um, we, usually in, in science writing, it tends to be friendly. Um, the people we interview tend to not be hiding things and are, are delighted to talk about research always, but that's typically what happens. And then as an editor, it's my job to ask the reporters to ask more questions and to, to get confused and to make sure that there's nothing in the story that could be misunderstood or misinterpreted. Uh, and to just be like really, really clear at every stage. I wonder, you know, we're going to talk about COVID, but I wonder if you could share a little bit about the kinds of stories that you had the most interest in, the greatest fun, greatest challenges um, writing coming in to this year. I mean, every science yeah. writer has had to become a pandemic and vaccine expert this year to do their job. Um, but I don't know. For most of them, it wasn't their specialization. What were some of the areas of science you kept a close handle on up, up to this year? Yeah, until this year, I mean, vaccines, um, you know, last year were, were a big deal too, especially the vaccine resistance and the, the measles outbreak. And we had a record year for measles last year because of anti-vax, um, anti-vaxxers, activists um, getting to uh, isolated communities and and talking people out of vaccines, you know, raising all this misinformation. So, um, you know, even before this year, kind of the anti-vax uh, movement was a, a big issue, something I covered a lot at the Washington Post. And also just the rise of misinformation in the last, you know, four years, frankly, corresponding with the Trump administration, there's, it's, it's one of the hottest areas of research because it's one of the, you know, fastest growing phenomena of um, you know conspiracy theories spreading you know faster and wider than they ever have, and then not just you know misinforming people, but having real consequences, as of course we're seeing you know in the pandemic that it's it really is a matter of life or death if you if you, you know, understand evidence or don't. Um, so yeah, the misinformation obviously climate change is the the story of our lives. When when the pandemic is over, we'll still be dealing with climate change, and it's interesting to have some of the same challenges to communicate something that's really, you know, catastrophic, urgent, and important, but that people don't know about, don't want to accept as real. And we're seeing some of those challenges condensed into one year um, over the course of the pandemic. That's something that um, I really like the way you describe that continuity. I mean, these scientific issues of longstanding around public trust in science, around vaccination, around the pace of scientific discovery, around climate change, as you said, the scientific issue of our lives. Um, 
those are, were, were not just magically become relevant in March in the United yeah. States. They were already something that was on your on your radar. Let me, let's pivot. I'm gonna ask you a little bit about the magazine. Um, you have 175 on your masthead right now. And I have to admit, I mean, Scientific American has always been part of, of my life. I'm 47. Mm -hmm. It was always, even when you were in second or third grade and your teacher said, go write a, a report, you'd go to the library and you'd find issues of Scientific American. And that was the authoritative you know, that and the encyclopedia. I'm from the 20th century, so that's, you know, but but that, I mean, you're now the leader of a scientific communication instrument of very long standing from an American perspective. Can you give us just a little bit of the history, the magazine, particularly the parts that are interesting, most interesting to you, and then let's let's talk a little bit about what it's been like to be there this year. Yeah, definitely. We, yeah, so we just celebrated our 175th anniversary. And uh, yeah, it's so we're the oldest continuously published magazine in the United States, which I think is, is kind of nice that it's a science magazine that's been so persistent, um, you know, because science has been really important and something people care about throughout you know, the last 175 years. You know, when we started, our first issue was about the telegraph. That was the main, you know, the, the top story. And uh, initially it kind of covered a lot of inventions um, and when it was when it was kind of modernized in the 1940s, uh, it became a little bit more political and a, and a little more kind of engaged in the social issues of the day. So we had a, a lot of articles that were criticizing the arms race. Um, we had uh, pieces that were skeptical of, of the Star Wars missile defense system, uh, critical of, of uh, teaching creationism in schools, and very um, sort of for you know the teaching of evolution uh, and you know, we've 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 in, in for you know space exploration uh, from from a robotic scientific point of view. We weren't particularly for the crewed space space program. Uh, it was more you know on the science side than the than the yay raw um, kind of macho side. So it's yeah, it's been a very interesting magazine for a long time, and it's you know it's kind of changed you know over the course of obviously of 175 years. But our main kind of core uh, focus and specialty is. Um, helping scientists and other scholars and other experts write about their own work and their own fields in a way that anybody can appreciate and understand uh, and kind of elevating the voice of experts and, and showing the connection between what's happening in the research world and how it applies to the world at large. If we went back and looked at uh, the long track record of the magazine, when would we start finding women writing? Oh, good question. Oh, that, I should know that. Um, we did have some some women editors, I believe, in the forties. Uh, I don't know about before then. I sh I should find that out. But uh, yeah, not 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 as many as there could have been. And now we have more women than men editors. But that's a fairly recent phenomenon. So it's mirror. I mean, as it probably we would expect, it's it's a magazine that's mirrored science science's place in society and also the organization of who gets to be in science. Very much, yeah. And we, uh, we for our 175th anniversary, one of our articles, we kind of looked back at our mistakes, and there were, a, you know, were a lot of them, uh, including, uh, you know, giving, you know, we didn't endorse eugenics, but we allowed some people to write about eugenics in a, you know, in a way that made it seem like a perfectly reasonable, interesting scientific enterprise. Um, definitely a lot of sexism, a lot of racism. Um, so it's, you know, we, we kind of had a, a reckoning, um, you know, not comprehensive, but we did go through all the archives and kind of picked out the most embarrassing, awful things. Hmm. Uh, and not just to say, oh, look at how ignorant we were back then, but to, to kind of find the patterns of how you can, you know, you don't know what you don't know. And, um, and kind of a call to be more aware of the dangers of having a, a small set of people kind of analyzing what's happening in science and and, and kind of the, the requirements of gatekeepers to to not, you know, to keep the gate wide. Just a reminder that you're listening to COVID Calls and I'm talking to Laura, Hel Laura Helmuth today, the editor-in-chief of Scientific American Magazine. So what's it been like this year then? I've talked to lots of journalists and I'm always fascinated to know about um, how they modified their work in this time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course, it's been relentless. Um, so on, on, you know, on one side, it feels like this is what we've been training for our whole careers and, and warning about. I mean, I've, you know, as an editor, I've published, you know, dozens and dozens of articles saying a pandemic is coming. We're not prepared. And so it came and we knew right away, this is going to be awful. 
this is, you know, like our jobs have never been more important. And I think that would have been in the case in, you know, the best case scenario. Um, but especially this year when we've had so much misinformation coming out of the White House that we've had to, you know, explain what's happening with this very, very quickly moving science of the pandemic, explain really the basics of public health, but, you know, things people need to do to protect themselves and debunk just all the misinformation or you know, the, the most important misinformation, as in the article that you read at the top of the show, um, you know, just lies about death rates and, and lies about all these other just basic things. It's, it's really been catastrophic, you know, how bad this misinformation has been. And it's, it's made the pandemic much worse than it needed to be. So we're kind of trying to elevate real information and help people understand why they shouldn't be believing this misinformation all at the same time. Has the balance of readership shifted from the print magazine to online? I mean, I know that's a process that's going on mm -hmm. anyway, but I wonder about this year, has that accelerated any trends along those lines? Yeah, I think it has. Um, we definitely were seeing more traffic than we did last year. Uh, and and if, you, if you look at the stories that are most popular, the coronavirus um, stories tend to tend to be the most read. So we are bringing in more people who are really interested in the immune system right now, in a way that you know they didn't have to be last year. Uh, so we're getting getting a lot more traffic, and also you know because this this pandemic is changing so quickly, it's really important to have updated information online. Um, and with the with the print section, we're still you know we're we're covering a lot of pandemic stories, publishing them in print, um, but they tend to be a little less urgent, um, mm -hmm. you know, the more kind of comprehensive, um, you know, synthetic kind of looking at what we've learned on a months long scale rather than on a you know, last couple weeks long scale. I mean, to, to me, that is so fascinating to think about the scale challenge, what you just described. So, you know, science moves along at its pace, different pace for different fields and subfields. So you might be tracking a set of discoveries and publications over a long period of time. Um, and then maybe shorter term things, of course, that will pop up in the news that would be maybe connected to public policy. But what you're describing is multiple timescales here, yeah. including sort of spot news and fact checking. I mean, do you have have you had to assign reporters who literally are doing fact checking in real time and putting that up on your website? Yeah, we're trying to respond very quickly. That's amazing. Uh, kind of the, the fastest response is uh, a Q&A. If there's something in the in in the news, we'll find you know an expert who we really trust, who really knows what they're talking about, and just have a quick conversation and do some reality checking about you know, what's happening and and what people need to know. Uh, but then we also have news stories. We have you know, our feature stories are longer term, and then we also we're publishing a lot of opinion pieces uh, where where experts write in their own words. Uh, public, a lot of public health experts, a lot of doctors, nurses have been writing for us this year. That Q and A format is is a good one. Although they seem to this year have followed kind of a similar pattern. The question: the president said something today about coronavirus. Is it right? Answer: No. <laughs> How strange is is that? I want to sort of get you to say more about this issue of science communicators and Scientific American specifically um, having to speak up just for facts. Yeah. and co correcting not just misinformation, like getting something wrong, that could happen. Policymakers <laughs> are not epidemiologists, okay. But disinformation, strategically planted. Yeah, yeah, it's, it'd be, it, when we stop to think about it, we're furious. I mean, you know, the, the, the lies, the disinformation are killing people. Like more people are dead who should be alive uh, because of what, Trump has lied about about this pandemic. So, you know, it's maddening to think about it, but it but it kind of energizes us to outcompete the misinformation, um, you know, to explain why it's wrong, to tell people what they do need to know um, very urgently. And, you know, it's been going on throughout his administration. And you know, part of the problem is not just saying, okay, he's wrong and we're right, but one of his main messages throughout his administration and during his campaign was you can't trust the news you know everybody's fake news they're just making it up they're making up the the pandemic they're making it a hoax don't listen to them and so and, and he's you know obviously said some of the same things about the medical experts as well so it's it's not just journalists that he's picking on he he you know anybody who has information that he's not happy about he just says don't believe it and so that's kind of another hurdle where we have to 
um, you know, be extra careful to demonstrate, here's how we know what we know and, um, and update people's knowledge. And, you know, part of the, this is sort of a, a different mm -hmm. issue, but, you know, the, because this pandemic has, has, you know, really, um, evolved in a lot of ways and, and the sciences has grown so quickly. There are a lot of things that, um, you know, the best experts thought were true in February or March that turned out to not be true. And, you know, from our perspective, we're like, hey, great, you know, science right. is iterative and self-correcting. Now we know more than we did. Um, but people who are, you know, ill-intentioned can say, oh, you can't trust scientists because they just make stuff up. So we have to sort of do the extra step of explaining why at first, you know, that you had to wash your hands and sing happy birthday twice. And now you should mm -hmm. wear a mask because, you know, we didn't understand why temperature checks don't really matter as much because, people who are asymptomatic are doing most of the spread. And we didn't know that, that you could spread it asymptomatically in February or March. So it's a lot of kind of explaining the process of science, the process of journalism, the process of science communication, so that people don't feel like they're being lied to or jerked around. They can appreciate that, okay, this is, and we need to keep updating what we know and understand. I wanna stay with this a little bit because often this issue, as I read it this year, has been presented in a very binary way that people either um, trust that there are baseline facts and there's science out there, or they don't. The president has preyed on those who don't, and they he's tried to use them as part of an electoral strategy, you know, to lock down certain votes to keep them agitated. My sense though, is that there's a pretty broad spectrum there, and that mm -hmm. people who believe in trust in science, some of them are also the harshest critics of science and the scientific enterprise and the funding of science. And that people who so are so-called deniers who don't believe in science, when they get sick, they still go to the doctor and get an antibiotic. So I want to sort of bring this back to you. You started down this road. Can you say a little bit more about how you, just how you intervene in that space? You gave one clue, which is to sort of try to demythologize a bit the flow of information. So why can a scientist say something on Monday, but by the next Monday, they might be saying something a little different. What, what are some of the other sort of things that go into this form of communication? Yeah, and we're trying to be informed by the research on um, on misinformation and conspiracies and how they spread and and the you know the best the best strategies for kind of updating people's misinformation or debunking misinformation so that we don't inadvertently kind of amplify bad information by saying, you know, X, Y, Z isn't true. Um, so we, you know, are, we, we, we try to use the method of saying, you know, here's, uh, here's a true thing. Here's something that people think that that isn't true. Here's why they think it's true. Here's where it came from. Here's why you're seeing it on Facebook from your uncle. And, um, and, and, and sort of kind of radically empathize with the people who are confused because it's a scary, confusing year. And this is a scary, confusing disease, and it just, you know, it keeps getting scarier. Um, even the more we learn, you know, as, as like all these new symptoms come in and these new ways of transmission, like there's just so much more to learn. And every single thing about it is a little challenging to comprehend. And so we're trying to, to kind of always keep in mind that, you know, the reader wants as much clarity as we can give. Um, and also wants to know, you know, why if we see something isn't true, how do we know it's not true? Why are they seeing that it is true? And, and you know, how how is that knowledge come about? Um, and and I think another thing we we've, we've really been trying to do uh, very kind of uh, intentionally this year is to say, here's what we know so far. Um, and we often put that in headlines. Here's what we know about, you know, asymptomatic transmission so far. Here's what we know about why the sense of smell disappears in some people so far, which sort of acknowledges that it's an ongoing process. Right. We're telling you what we do know. There's still a lot of things that nobody does know and, and we'll update you as those come in. And, you know, it, some, th some questions we just don't have answers for yet. Um, and that doesn't mean we're hiding anything. It means that people are actively working on it. One of the great frustrations, I think, in the last 20 years for scientists and science communicators around climate has been you know, this problem of you know, seeing their work undermined. Uh, and you know, if you dig into it a little bit, um, Naomi Oreskes and Eric Conway and others have written um, very compelling, I think, in showing that that's not accidental. That's not some flaw necessarily in the communication or in the recipient of the communication. It's that there are deep pocketed interests who are presenting counter information to make it confusing. Yeah. And that's 
I understand that so far as it goes and why a person might say, well, I don't believe in climate change because maybe they're not perceiving it in their daily life. What I still don't understand, and I wanted to ask you about this, is when you're manifestly in danger, like in the middle of a pandemic, what's your sense of why people will still reject a scientific authority and instead trust somebody like Donald Trump? Yeah, it's it's so frustrating. I mean, you know, it seems like it's a lot of in-group um, identification. Um, you know, we, we've had several articles in a lot of places have about, particularly with masks, how it's kind of, it, it has been turned into a sign of, of emasculation that, you know, real men are tough. Real men don't worry about getting sick. They don't go to the hospital. I mean, there's all this sort of like toxic masculinity that is, is pretty common that, that, you know, manifests in a lot of different ways. And it seems to really be showing up in sort of this macho he-man, I'm not going to wear a mask and you can't make me uh, type of problem. So um, that's a hard one to crack. That's so we're, we're, we're trying to, you know, amplify the message of wearing a mask is a way you can protect your community. And, you know, that's a masculine value too, uh, to get through some of that. Um, but it's, it's really hard. And, and of course, you know, as this, because the stakes are so high, the people who've been embracing Trump's messages, um, you know, they, right now, if they were to, to turn around and say, you know what, I was wrong about this and everybody else was right. Like the, the more you commit to a cult, basically, the harder it is to walk away from it. Just a reminder to folks, you're listening to COVID calls and I'm talking to Laura Helmuth, the editor in chief of Scientific American. You can get your questions in on YouTube live, just put them in the, in the comments. Uh, and you can also um, get a question in on Twitter. If you want to just be sure to tag me at us of disaster or if you want to be old school about it, which I appreciate, you can email me directly, sgk23 at drexel.edu, and I'll be monitoring that. So among the many um, things that caught my attention in the world of science communication this year, Laura, October 1st, Scientific American uh, did something pretty extraordinary, and I want to just give a little quote from it. For the first time in the history of the magazine, um, you endorsed a candidate, and I'm just going to quote here. Trump's reaction to America's worst public health crisis in a century has been to say, I don't take responsibility at all. Instead, he blamed other countries and his White House predecessor who left office three years before the pandemic began. Joe Biden, in contrast, comes prepared with plans to control COVID-19, improve health care, reduce carbon emissions, and restore the role of legitimate science and policymaking. He solicits expertise and has turned that knowledge into solid policy proposals. So um, the editorial desk endorsed a candidate. Yeah, first time in 175 years. Um, now looking back, we, we probably should have endorsed Abraham Lincoln. I mean, if we had that to do over again, we, we would have. How was uh, he as a science president? I had to think about that for a minute. I, he was good technology president. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, he, I mean, he's got a patent. He's, uh, I forget what it was, some some kind of uh, riverboat patent. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Model at Smithsonian. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a big decision, but it was kind of an, an obvious decision and a unanimous decision. All of us on the editorial board, uh, who were just you know the editors at Scientific American, um, decided that this, you know, I think we would have endorsed anyway, just because of the anti-science um, behavior throughout the administration. But the, uh, the COVID pandemic just made it really clear that it, it really is deadly to have a, a, a president who rejects and diminishes and suppresses science. Um, you know, he's, it, it, it kills people, these things. So um, we thought it was, uh, it was the time to, to, to say very clearly, you know, just, you know, leaving aside all the other reasons to vote for Biden versus Trump, if you just look at his record in terms of research, uh, in terms of funding, the you know federal science, how policies are decided, um, you know the acceptance of conspiracy theories by him and his administration, just for all these reasons, if if you really want to vote on the basis of you know evidence and reality and and making decisions based on the best available knowledge, that that Trump is is you know a, a menace and that Biden is is really a, a was a, a great candidate and we hope will do a much better job. I'm sure we will do a much better job with the pandemic and with everything else science related. We've had presidents who were hostile to um, science. I think you could say that with some confidence, or or mm -hmm. pretty hostile to certain branches of life-saving science. I think the Bush administration, um, both of them, but certainly the more recent one, um, could be in that camp. So why 
why not weigh in in that time? I know yeah. you weren't there, so I'm not asking you to answer, but but maybe you can give us a sense. Yeah, I think so. Back then, um, you know, looking at the George W. Bush administration, we uh, we had we did have a lot of opinion pieces endorsing you know stem cell research and criticizing his administration for turning a science issue into a religious issue and putting all these you know, really kind of unreasonable and, and not particularly logical constraints on the you know, on stem cell research and other things. Like I think I mentioned earlier, yeah, you know, the um, the um, Star Wars defense missile defense system under the Reagan and H.W. Bush administrations. I mean, that, that was you know nonsense. I mean, from just looking at the physics of it, it was complete nonsense. And so we were you know clear about specific policies back then, and we're very critical of some of the anti science policies of previous presidents. Um, but I, yeah, I think there was a, a sense that we should, you know, stay away. I mean, we're, you know, we don't consider ourselves partisan. We certainly don't think that science should be partisan. Um, and but it, you know, it was it was really just Donald Trump's been so, you know, outside of all the norms um, that it was it was time to 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 break our our standards or change our standards. So how was the reaction? I think I can anticipate some of it. I'll tell you, my reaction was I was surprised. Mm -hmm. And very gratified um, to see that um, sort of long-standing media was willing to come in and say, as you've said, this is an extraordinary time. And it's not just about the sort of normal back and forth politics of science, which I think is something we expect in a democracy, but that this was actually about an acute danger to people's lives. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a war, it was a, you know, fire bell in the night. That was my reaction, but I don't represent the full electorate. So, what else did you hear? Well, we were uh, we were prepared for a lot of criticism, um, but the response was overwhelmingly positive. Uh, certainly on social media, um, you know, we we had a lot of people subscribe for the first time, which we were really we weren't expecting. We were really gratified about that. That was it was just so nice that people were willing to kind of you know pay to support uh, our journalism, and and so that was that was wonderful. Um, on social media, most of the responses were very positive. We did have a few people, a few longtime subscribers give up their subscriptions. And one thing that was sort of <laughs> telling, I think, is that the um, quite a lot, there, you know, there weren't that many people who gave up their subscriptions, but many of them who did sent letters to us that started with the salutation, dear sirs. <laughs> so <All right>. <laughs> <laughs> there's other things going on. And and the one, you know, the right. people who, who, who drop their subscriptions, many of them complained that we were paying too much attention to racism. And, you know, the, they, they, um, they thought they were they were they were saying that science shouldn't be political, and I think our response to that is that you know science isn't you know we didn't politicize science. It's the Trump administration um, started it, and you know they're the ones who he and, and his administration are the ones who are trying to stick politics in the realm of science, um, and and that's you know is is dangerous and wrong and bad. I think that's this is always a challenge. Uh, you know, I mean, in the history of science and science, technology, society, research, the kind of world that I'm in, um, we, I think I can speak for most of us, we take a lot of pride in the idea that it's um, perfectly okay and should be expected to ask hard questions about science, mm -hmm. about the intentions of the work, how it's funded, how, what counts as evidence, what doesn't, and then also persistent questions, like you just said, about inequality. You know, science assumes a lot of equality, and or traditionally, the way people have talked about science, it's assumed all participate equally and all benefit equally. And I think um, we have lots of research now, three generations worth, to show that that's that's not the case. That science is embedded in society, and it and it is political. How much of that do you feel has been taken on board, uh, maybe broadly in science journalism, and specifically in Scientific American? Yeah, I think across science journalism. You know, across journalism in general, I think this year in particular, people are realizing like how misleading it is and how you know bad for the industry it is, and, and you know for the audience, for the people involved, that it's so white. Um, you know, it's not representative of our audiences or who our audiences we want our audiences to be. And you know, in, in you know, white people have a have biases in the way that we see and experience the world, and it's not you know it's not 
serving the you know the mission of journalism, not serving the mission of science journalism. And I think kind of science is is having a similar reckoning. And it's not like it just started this year. This is this has been ongoing. And I think you know, especially during the Trump administration, there's been much more awareness that racism isn't just going to end itself. And it's not, you know, it, it should, you know, black people aren't the people who can stop racism. It's white people have to be, have to be actively anti-racist and, you know, educating themselves, doing what they can to make the institutions where we have any power be more anti-racist. And so I think that that realization has been growing in, in science and in journalism. Um, you know, it's a little tricky right now, obviously with the um, pandemic, um, you know, every, everybody's just so focused on that, but at you know, Scientific American, we're trying to to bring in um, you know more people of color as as writers, as the experts that we quote, as the experts who we ask to write opinion pieces um, or feature pieces, and uh, and we're making some you know making some progress. We need to do a lot more. I think like you know like most most all publications do. We really are trying to to do a better job. Well, thank you for that. I mean, that's really powerfully said, and and I think it means a lot. You know, to to say it's one thing to describe inequalities that we see, and social scientists do this to, with some detachment. It's quite another thing to say we don't have everybody in the room right now who needs to be in the room to describe what we're seeing. It sounds like you know, that's the process you've been undergoing there. Yeah, yeah, that's what we're trying trying to bring more people into the room. So you know, with that, but let me turn to a sort of another feature of this year, which to me has been surprising, I think, is that there are now scientists in America that are household names again. Yeah, yeah. What do you think about that? I, know. I have a Tony Fauci. I've bought two Tony Fauci um, uh, iPhone cases. I bought my son a pair of Tony Fauci socks. These were not premeditated things. I'm like, here's a scientist. We should have a pair of socks with this face on. Dr. Burks, even yeah. um, Dr. Atlas, and I know that you know there's a lot of um, so a lot to be said there about you know his theories and philosophies. Then I think that they're wrong, um, but he's become a household name. So scientific controversy has become also something that happens around the dinner table this year. Yeah, I mean it's it's a shame it took a pandemic for this to happen, but I, yeah, I'm delighted to see yeah. that. You know, I think it's it, obviously it's humanizing science to know that these are actual people, not just you know, faceless white coats. Um, it, it's kind of funny, you know, I've been covering Fauci's work, you know, for 22 years, 25 years, and you know, he's just some dude, he's just Tony Fauci, you know, <laughs> he's like this big hero. But it's nice to see, I mean, he seems like a decent guy. Um, it, we're, we're hoping that this year is building people's interest in science. You know, there's, in a way, the, the more you know about something, you know, the more interesting it is. I mean, certainly, you know, with, when people start getting into baseball or or finance or something, you know, at first it's all kind of you know weird jargon and people you don't understand and all these you know all these kind of social norms that are just whatever. Um, but then the more you learn, the more interesting it is. And so we're hoping that people are kind of building their capacity. Um, I mean, there's just all these words like you know asymptomatic spread and. Uh, you know, cytokine storm that that people speak who you know didn't know those those terms before, and so we're hoping this will this will build into kind of an ongoing interest in in not just health science but all kinds of other science too. Isn't that kind of the long-standing mission of a magazine like Scientific American and other um, public broadcasting? Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, educational products in that sort of intermediate space, knowing that not every American, not even the majority of Americans will go to college. Yeah. And that there's always a challenge for funding in schools. So there needs to be another sort of strata there of education where you meet people where they are. But it seems like an awful challenge to educate people in the middle of a pandemic, just on what yeah. you were just describing. Yeah, I mean, at least we do have their attention because the, you know, right. they're scared right. and confused and want to know more. So. Um, so they're willing to willing to learn, want to learn, um, you know. And people are learning about PCR and and you know all the different kinds of tests and is it a nasal swab and you know how the vaccines work and boosters and and all these things. So um, yeah, we're really you know we've always kind of been here for what we you know what we call the lifelong learners um, mm -hmm. who just you know want to know more about how the world works. Um, but I think that you know the a lot of people are feeling more urgency about that to to understand the pandemic. To me, the pandemic is such a total experience, and I think of this from a disaster research perspective, 
that it it becomes the background of, against which everything else can be analyzed and understood. I was talking with this about this with my guest yesterday. We're talking about the pandemic in Scandinavia. I mean, you're, you're talking about the pandemic, but then the next thing you know, you're talking about the reemergence of borders in Europe. Um, and as yeah. you and I were just talking about, you know, you can't understand this pandemic this year without talking about structural racism in America, mm -hmm. climate change also. Mm -hmm. So I wonder, do you see it or to what extent do you see the pandemic and the reporting on the pandemic as an opportunity also to move into foster attention and literacy in other spaces, perhaps? Yeah, we definitely are. And specifically about racism, um, there's, a, there's a line that we've, we've used in, in several different stories. And I think it was the headline for one of our stories, which is that racism, not race, is a risk factor for dying of COVID. And, um, and, and you know, I think kind of without really thinking about it, you know, we, we have been used kind of shorthand for, you know, people who have African ancestry are at higher risk of sickle cell anemia. And, you know, that, okay, that's, that's a good example. That's a very specific example. But I think there's been a lot of coverage of, oh, you know, black people are, have a higher risk for um, stroke or, or for whatever. And there's kind of been an implication or a, or a, a possible assertion or assumption that, oh, it must be something genetic. You know, they're, they're must, they're, they're, their bodies must be different. But that's not it. It's, it's, you know, it's the social world, the environment that, that people experience that leads to a higher risk of, of stroke or dying of, of, of COVID-19. Um, so we're trying to be just much more clear about that, that this, this pandemic is revealing, um, you know, this, these longstanding health disparities in, in just a horrific way and making it really clear that it's the racism that's the problem. So I want to ask you about the science stories that we've missed this year. What? Not everything is epidemiology and the race for a vaccine. Uh, contrary to what I just said, we can't see the whole world through the pandemic, but there's certainly the normal pace of scientific discoveries going on. I know at Drexel University, the first people who wanted to get back to campus uh, were people who have labs, obviously, because they have ongoing work there. So what are some of the stories that you've kept an eye on that, that we missed? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, obviously with climate, you know, 2020 is on track to be the hottest year ever recorded. Um, and even if it isn't, it'll be the hottest year ever recorded that isn't an El Nino year, the other, you know, top ones. And we've broken all kinds of other records about hurricanes. I mean, just the disasters this year. I mean, you must in addition to the pandemic, obviously, you must be really busy just paying attention to all the you know other types of disasters. So there's all that, and but there's happy news too. Like uh, the Japan's Hayabusa 2 mission just returned from an asteroid with a scoop of of dust and rocks that could explain you know planetary formation. And yeah, you know, that's normally something that would have been just huge news. And we we've had several stories about it, but they're they're not getting as much attention as they would have in a, in a good year. Um, and then there's you know of course other research on other you know medical issues, you know, there, there've been all these, just this slow, steady, but life-saving advances in cancer treatments. Um, and it looks like we're going to, you know, have a backslide this year because so many people are, you know, deciding to, to delay their mammograms or prostate exams or, or colonoscopies. Um, so there's probably going to be like a, a wave of a blip of increase in cancer deaths after we've seen years and years of steady mm -hmm. increase. Um, yeah. And then I, I think this year has been a, a really important year for, for social science especially um, for mental health, uh, for under, you know, like uh, systemic racism again, um, but understanding, you know, the, the role of, of, um, of loneliness, unemployment, uh, just all these, all these social issues that change people's psychology so profoundly. Can we talk a little bit more about vaccines? I know it's an issue that we touched on a little bit earlier and, um, I feel like the pandemic, you know, covering the pandemic must have, it's enfolded in various different phases. Um, it's a disaster in, in multiple acts. And we're in the sort of um, excitement of discovery phase of it right now, I, I suppose. Um, how excited are you or how interested are you in the, in the way that this has unfolded in this messenger RNA um, achievement, I guess we can call it that. And what are you got your eye on for the next few months in terms of the delivery phase of it? Yeah, I mean, the, it looks like so far the the development of the vaccine and the clinical trials have have gone about as quickly and as efficiently and as well as we could have ever hoped. So that's all good news. Um, so you know, we, we you know, we're getting all these data from 
you know, what we call phase three clinical trials, um, where it's you know, a massive trial looking at safety and efficacy and, and the, um, the vaccines have done really well. And now we're entering you know, the state, what we call the stage four trial, uh, state, or stage four phase of, 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 of clinical trials where it's out in the world and there will be um, you know, probably more uh, side effects, uh, more issues with people of, you know, with, of different ages, um, who have you know different quirks of their immune system where the vaccine might not work as well or might might cause problems. So there's going to be um, just a lot of of coverage of you know who who needs to get it first. Are there any dangers? What do we need to be aware of? Um, and we're we're kind of preparing to to you know, just be very open and um, and clear that yeah you know, there are side effects with any vaccine and um, this is what to expect. This is you know why not to panic. Um, and this, and just providing people with the with the best evidence of, of how well it's working and who it's working for, and, and how we know. I just want to bring up a question, uh, Jorge Benavides Rawson, uh, who is a very uh, committed listener to COVID calls, and good to see your question here, Jorge. And I, I wonder if I could just focus in on one part of this. He asks, "What do you think of other salient topics that cross cut with the pandemic? Healthcare as a commodity versus healthcare as a human right, capitalism, scientific cooperation." versus competition. Uh, I'm particularly interested in, the, in your take on that first one because, uh, you know, I don't have to explain to anybody who's listening here that there's longstanding tension between um, uh, science as a sort of commons and science as a public good versus science um, as leading towards industry and, and the growth of, of corporate interests and bottom line for shareholders. How do you think that's going to cross cut with this vaccine issue. Mm -hmm. we, we learned in the news a couple of days ago that the administration, even when it had an opportunity, has not gotten in its orders to cover everyone who's going to need it in, a short, in, the, in the near term. So presumably the administration doesn't see access to the vaccine as a, as a right in America. Yeah, it's just shocking. I mean, this, this pandemic has shown, you know, more urgently than, than anything that, you know, public health is a great investment and not investing in public health is extremely expensive. I mean, whatever it costs to vaccinate a whole bunch of people or to, you know, to give workers sick leave so they don't come to work when they're sick, like all these just basic things that, you know, in, in short term thinking, you might save a little bit of money by not giving people sick leave, but then it's just catastrophic for, you know, for your company, for society. Um, you know, I mean, there's nothing like an infectious disease to show how connected we all are and how, making sure that everybody can be as healthy as they can is good for all of us. You know, it's good for schools. It's good for companies. It's good for retirement homes. Um, you know, we're not in this together and, we, and, you know, we infectious disease is the, it just the kind of most dramatic example of how not taking care of people is, is fundamentally a, you know, a bad economic decision. So scientific American endorsed Joe Biden. Um, so what are you expecting? Um, not what he's going to deliver for the magazine, but what is he? What are you looking for in the Biden administration? And, and let me just throw a couple things out. One is, um, what could we expect? Do you think from the Office of Science and Technology Policy? I know Kelvin Drogmeyer, um, who full disclosure is a person I've met and have a lot of respect for. He's been in that role. Um, do you expect a revitalization? Uh, in terms of science as providing direct advice to the administration, the ways that different um, executive agencies might be regarded. What are you looking for? Yeah, exactly. I mean, we want, you know, right now, OSTP is just a shell of itself, of its former self. So they need to, you know, appoint a whole bunch of people to OSTP, need to pay more attention to scientists in, in you know, the, most of, you know, aside from like defense, um, most of what the government does has to do with science in one way or another. And if you look at all the agencies at EPA, at NOAA, at, um, you know, to, to not so much NSF and NIH, they've been fairly uh, protected, relatively protected. But, um, you know, even USGS, uh, National Weather Service, like all these agencies that should just be about what is the best knowledge that we can share to help, you know, make good policy decisions and save people's lives. Like they've been just stocked with with a clown car of political appointees who not only don't know what they're talking about, but are actively hostile to the business of these agencies. Um, so, you know, get rid of all those people, bring in people who know what they're doing and, you know, fix, you know, clean up the mess. And that's gonna be a big, a, a lot of work. 
Um, but it's not enough to just go back to what the Obama administration had. You know, it's, it's going to take a while to get back to that. But we need to do he we, um, you know, the, the federal government needs to do so much more than that. Um, you know, we lost a lot of time on climate change. And, you know, so we need to, to you know, be even more urgent and about, um, you know, changing the energy infrastructure, about changing um, certainly wildlife conservation laws. Those have been just devastated during the Trump administration, you know, bringing, bringing in all kinds of, you know, clean air issues. I mean, the, the, another issue with the coronavirus is that people who live in areas with high pollution are, are much more susceptible to a serious reaction because their lungs are just, you know, already traumatized by mm. having fine particulates, which you know, we, can, we can pass along and change what the air is that people breathe. And those are some of the things that I think um, the Biden administration just needs to jump on right away. How long do you think they need to uh, unload the clown car, as you said? <laughs> I, hope, I hope they're fast about it. Um, you know, the, what happens at the end of any administration is that people tend to burrow in and the political appointees try to get, you know, permanent positions. So I hope that the Biden administration is very efficient at, at burrowing them out and, and making sure that Trump's appointees are, you know, out of the way and and you know, stop stop them from doing damage as, as quickly as possible. Uh, he's, you may have some. Uh, you certainly will have great perspective on this, given the different publications you work with. I mean, every administration wants uh, good reception from the press. Uh, Trump wanted bad reception from the press because to him that was good reception from the press. But most conventional administrations want to develop those relationships, and and they want a lot of coverage. Um, as they move in these spaces, as you said, in climate change. Can you say a little bit about how that, when there's a turnover, just in your experience of administration, how that process works? I think that's really opaque to a lot of people. When a new administration comes in and they want to talk about esoteric things like science, how do they develop the relationship with the media? Yeah, that's a good question. And it it varies. It, it seems to be very much a relationship-based economy, like you say, but, you know, they, they have their favorite reporters that they'll call on and, and, you know, form relationships and, and share information. And, and, um, you know, that if they're astute, which I'm sure they are, they'll pit rivals against each other. So, and the Trump, the Trump administration was good at this too. You know, they'd give something to the Washington Post, they'd give something to the New York Times and kind of fight each other in the, in the, in the newspapers. So you can do that in a functional way too, by, um, you know, uh, working on, on their sense of, of, of their, of their uh, kind of competition and wanting to be the first and have the inside story and all that. Um, you know, with the Biden administration, he is bringing in a lot of people who have a lot of experience. You know, he has so much experience in, 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 the, you know, in the Senate as vice president. So he's bringing in a lot of people from the Obama administration who still have relationships with, with the media. Um, and I think, it, I think it'll be a pretty quick process. You know, when, when, Trump, when Trump won election at the Post, um, you know, the, I think there was some concern that that you know Breitbart and all the right wing news organizations would would have all the stories because they wouldn't be talking to the rest mm -hmm. of the media. Um, but I think every administration comes in and pretty quickly realizes they have to talk to everybody, and it's in their interest to do so. I want to just sort of continue with with this a little bit, a different perspective. I've heard a lot from people, um, journalists, about one of the things they've seen this year is the real impact of the decimation of local news. Yeah. And so, I mean, you're editor of, of a national, you, you have a national and international scope. Um, but I'm curious, you know, with Scientific American, to what extent um, you rely on more local, uh, more embedded um, forms of news production. It's been, to me, really something to see that the reporting particularly as it moved out of the media centers and went into the Midwest and into the South, they had to rely often on the New York Times or the Washington Post or the LA papers or Chicago papers that, and it's like, no, those stories could have been told by local reporters who might've known a lot more about the communities that are being ravaged right now. I think that's right. And I think that's, that's one of the factors that's made the pandemic so bad in so many places is, you know, it's a global pandemic, but it's a local story. You know, every outbreak is seeded by a funeral or a church service or, or Sturgis, you know, motorcycle rally or whatever. And it, 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 it's really important for reporters who know what they're talking about to share with people um, in, in language that they, you know, that in, in the kind of 
not just local dialect, but you know, the using the the same values and cultural expectations of their audience, you know, to talk about why you need to be wearing a mask and why you shouldn't be going to choir practice indoors and and things like that. And I, I think I think it's really it's I think it's exacerbated the pandemic that that there has been so little uh, that that so many local news organizations have have shut down or, or shut you know, have laid off a lot of reporters this year. So we're almost up on time, but I wanted to try to, if it's okay with you, just a couple more things. I wonder um, right now, this sort of circles back to some things we are talking about earlier. Um, my students, uh, you know, when I talk to them about the pandemic, um, I get the feeling there are some journalists in the making. Yeah, great. That, and, I, and I wonder about that, and from your vantage point, and, and, you know, I know people don't, as you said earlier, people don't go into journalism to get rich. Uh, they go into journalism because they're curious. They have questions they want to answer. They're excited about interpreting complicated things so that people can get a, a handle on it. And boy, we are in times in which that skill set is obviously in need. What are you seeing in terms of, um, you know, increasing interest in science journalism at this time? Yeah, I think there is. I think um, from what I understand through the Trump administration, there's been an increasing number of, of college students who want to major in journalism or at least take some journalism classes. Um, and I believe that uh, there's been an increase in people applying to um, the, the, the programs that specialize in science and health and environment reporting. Um, so that uh, yeah, the, some of the big ones are New York University, um, UC Santa Cruz, which is the program I went to in California. Um, MIT has a really good program. So I think uh, I, I think there is an, an increased kind of awareness that this is an important career path and you know an exciting one and a, and a you know a rewarding one. Um, and I think we're also seeing an increase in people applying to to medical school. so mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and I, I hope other healthcare professions too. Do you anticipate as we go into 2021 and people do have access to the vaccine? that your um, COVID stories are going to start to fall off in terms of clicks and, and traction. I mean, it, it's, it strikes me as a difficult thing to do. You staff up to cover something of this magnitude. And then when the vaccine comes, I, I guess we don't really know. It, it won't roll out all at once, but we don't really know what the psychological impact of people is going to be. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, it, it's going to be a complicated year. You know, with the manufacturing issues, the distribution, um, you know, a lot of bioethics discussions about who should be getting it first. Um, you know, at what point are schools safe? You know, all these all these risk uh, analyses that people have to do and, and really understand, you know, what these decisions are based on. So there's going to be a lot, a lot to cover. And at what point do you stop wearing masks? At what time? You know, at what point is it safe to get in a crowded bus? You know, all these all these decisions people are be making throughout the throughout the year. Um, so we'll be covering all that closely. And then I think. You know, long term, just the consequences of, um, you know, depression, anxiety, um, you know, probably um, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. I mean, a lot of people are washing their hands more than they ever did. Mm -hmm. uh, disorders. Uh, there are a lot of, and, and of course, as we mentioned, like the the consequences of of delayed detection of of diabetes, of heart disease, of cancer. Um, so there's just going to be a huge disruption to all kinds of things in the in the health system. And then we'll see, you know, science. Uh, with the shutdown, you know, there's there's been you know less in-person collaboration, but I think we've seen the power of, of uh, people, you know, of scientists around the world, you know, quickly sharing their data, um, collaborating, kind of working urgently and racing, but you know, I think cooperating more than than even we've seen in the past. And science tends to be very cooperative, so I think it's been a really a, a great model for how science can progress quickly in the future. I want to remind everybody that you've been listening to COVID Calls, and you can catch COVID Calls every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern time. Please be sure to join me tomorrow. I'm going to talk with John Cunningham of the National AIDS Memorial, and we're going to continue our sort of ongoing discussion on COVID Calls about memorialization and COVID-19. And I want to um, thank Laura Helmuth for her time today and for everything that you've done. We talked just a little bit before the program for your encouragement of historians actually to be involved in media and just for the astounding work that you're doing. Great job. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Okay, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow at five o'clock. Stay healthy. See you then.